Welcome to the Savvy Painter Podcast, the podcast for artists who mean business. Here's your host, Antrice Wood. Hello, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. David Chevlino is my guest today. David paints figures in landscapes. His work is marked by bold, loose brushstrokes and thick, juicy paint. He studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and the Art Student League in New York. David's paintings can be seen at Thomas Dean's Fine Art, Quidley and Company, Gallery 1261, Somerville Manning, and on his website, davidchivalino.com. This is a two-part interview. In part one, David talks about how he discovered art on his own as a teenager and found the right school to nurture his development at a time when a lot of schools weren't interested in the work he wanted to create. We also talk about how David made small pivots in his career in response to a bad economy, and also how he was able to make a bold transition in his painting style. Do you remember the very first painting that you did that you were really proud of? Uh, that would be going back quite a ways. I, let's see, I would have been probably in my early teens, and I started out by copying some old master paintings from from some books that I had at the time. I would have been about 14 or 15, and I think there were some paintings I may have, I may have copied by you know, Peter Paul Rubens. And mm. I remember thinking, that, well, at the time, and even now as I look back, I think considering that I was about 14 or 15, when I painted them, I felt good about them. So I'd, I'd say, yeah, I'd say it was probably a, around that time between the ages of 14 and 15. Do you still have them? I, I do. Well, I do. I, they're actually, you know, they, they're actually hanging in my mother's house. <laughs> <laughs> but they do still exist. I have a drawing of a horse when I did when I was like five years old. I still remember doing that drawing. <laughs> yeah, I think things like that are, they have a lot, a lot of uh, significance. There's like an emotional attachment as well. Because those, it's like, you know, learning how to crawl pictures of yourself as you're learning how to crawl or you're taking your first steps. That was a very formative time for me when I was and formative in, in that my first exposure to art and art history and painting was through looking at, you know, the artwork of the old masters. And I, I went to museums when I was pretty young. So that was very formative for me. So my doing copies of that work has a, it's like a great reflection of how that kind of work impacted me at the time. So, so the paintings that I did or the drawings that I did during that time, you know, have a lot of significance for me mm -hmm. where I, where I started. Yeah. It's kind of the time when you're really falling in, in love with the idea of being an artist maybe and, and getting yeah. and really looking at art on your own as opposed to in some academic or, or parental form. Right, and in my case, all of my exposure to art was on my on my own. I didn't come from a place or a, a background where where I had exposure to art, so I basically somehow figured it out on my own. So that too, right, like right there, that fact is also is significant in my in my life and my career, and that I you know I I discovered these things for myself. What do you think attracted you to it at first? Like, was there a um, I don't know, a person or a painting or an event that made you think, I want to go look at art, or I'm really interested in this? Well, I can, I can tell you a little bit about the circumstances and those things that led to me making those decisions. The way I, here's the way I would characterize. I was always good at doing, although I never really gave it more, I never really gave it a second thought until I was maybe about, like I said, about maybe 14 years old, and I don't know how but I, I started drawing more often and then started to seek out art books, books about art. And there was a, actually, I think there was a series of books at the time. They may even still be available by an artist. I think these things may, may have been produced during the 1950s. Uh, his name was, I think it was Walter Foster, and he had this whole series of these books. And I think I started looking at those initially, but the real breakthrough for me was when I started to discover the kind of paintings you would see in museums, the old masters like Rembrandt, the, the Dutch painters of the, uh, the 17th century, Flemish painters, the Renaissance painters, 
Uh, and that happened through through books. Somehow, I, I, and I don't remember, I got my hands on some books from my God, a neighbor's garage sale or something like that. And I remember finding maybe a book, one or two small books about Rembrandt. And I remember going through the small book uh, on Rembrandt and uh, I was fascinated by it. I was just hooked like almost immediately. I was just hooked by all of these books. And uh, there were some other books too by other old masters. But I remember, I still remember to this day that the book on Rembrandt had, it had a painting by, I think it may have been a student of Rembrandt's, but it was a painting of an artist standing in front of his easel in his studio. And I remember just looking at that and being enthralled and thinking, wow, that's, that just sounds like, that just looks like such a cool thing to just be in this studio with a, you know, a needle in front of you holding a paintbrush and a palette. And, and there was something about that. I, rom- I romanticized that. I mean, I was only 14 or 15 at the time, but, you know, I didn't have a clue what, what that even meant. You know, the idea of an, what an artist does or how an artist even exists. But I just romanticized that and something in it, just something struck a chord in me. And that that had a really profound effect on me and just kind of spurred me on to continue looking at paintings and then and then seeking out museums I I grew up outside of New York City so I had I I was I had access to you know public transportation and was able to get myself to some museums and then that again that just further got the ball rolling and it was I was just hooked that's that's a great story. It reminds me, yeah, it reminds me a lot of discovering art books when I was a kid and just being like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and really just like I remember sitting on the floor and flipping through them and, right, you know, just being completely enthralled. Oh, yeah. And, and, and in that sense, I was not like, <laughs> I don't think I was like 99% of, you know, other 15 year old teenagers because I would just come home after school, you know, after school and go to the local library and just get books about art, (laughs) just, you know, (laughs) while other kids were doing the sorts of things, you know, that, that, you know, teenagers generally do. Yeah. Yeah. And here I was looking at these art books and, and then going to the museum on the weekend. So it was kind of unusual, especially, you know, given where I, you know, I, I come from a very working class blue collar background and I didn't really have any formal introduction to the arts. There wasn't anything like that in my school, you know, and I just somehow, uh, I just became immersed in this all on my own and, and just discovered it on my own. And I, I pretty much doing that. For the ever past. since? Yeah, ever, ever since. In, in some form or another. Fantastic. And you went to the both the Artists League and, and the Art Students League in New York and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Did your did your parents have like what was their reaction um, coming from a work you know, since they it doesn't sound like they were especially into the arts, did they have No, a, they weren't no, they weren't remotely into the arts. Well, I can I've thought about this and I've 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 had other people ask me that they were, even though they really didn't know anything about the arts or, or what an artist is or does, and I barely knew at that time either, they were nonetheless uh, very supportive of me. I, I actually wanted to go directly to the Pennsylvania Academy right out, of, and I did right out of high school, and uh, which would have been, I, I grew up in, in northern New Jersey, right near New York City. And Pennsylvania Academy is in Philadelphia, so it meant, you know, going down there and and checking out the school when I was a senior in high school and, you know, that they were okay with it. And there I went, you know, right out of high school. I think when I graduated, I was I was about 17 years old and from high school and then went directly into this art academy directly yeah, which, and, and, that's that is pretty rare. It is a little it is kind of rare. There's not there's maybe a handful of a handful of people that would have done that at the time and even right. and even more so because at the time the schools changed a lot since then but 
but even more so at the time because it, it did, did not give a degree. It was simply uh, this like, a, like an art academy. It was, um, you know, there was no kind of over, there was no supervision or it's not like, you know, a young person that goes to college where there, there are all sorts of things in place to, you know, so the parents can, you know, find out or hopefully know what's going on with the kid or there was no real guidance or anything like that. So I was just completely, wow. I was completely I mean, sort of in the deep end. Well, I, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I was definitely on the young side and most, most everyone else there at the school had already had a couple of years of college or something. If not, if, if, you know, not already a college degree. Right. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty unusual for someone as young as I was. Yeah, that's, wow, that's interesting, because um, I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit younger than you, but and I went to Arts Center in Pasadena in California, mm-hmm. and I remember, and I was 19 when I started, so I did have, like, one year of, of college somewhere else, and, and a lot of my teachers were like, oh, my God, you're such a baby, because I think the average age of the students was, like, 25, 26, and they already had a degree right. somewhere else. But I'm curious, what made you, so at 17, what, why Pennsylvania Academy of, of Fine Arts? Was there uh, somebody there that you, an artist there that you wanted to study with? Or Well, the way that happened, and there's like a small story to that too. I was a senior in high school. I had a guidance counselor who knew that I was interested in pursuing a career in art. And I think he gave me some information uh, or some literature about it would have been something like a portfolio day. That's what they called it, where you would go. It was actually what was then called the Philadelphia College of Art. It's now the University of the Arts. But I went down there and you know, told, my, told my parents about this. And I said, okay, we'll take you down there. Grabbed my sketchbooks with my you know, copies of old master paintings and, and you know, drawings I had done at the Metropolitan Museum of the sculptures there and things and whatnot. So I grabbed all these sketchbooks and we went down there and this would have been my senior year in high school and I showed all of this work to these various representatives from different schools. It it didn't go well at first <laughs> because I remember, you know, until later in the day, the one uh, interaction that I still remember to this day was talking to somebody from some school, I can't even remember which it was, but someone from the school after looking through these sketchbooks, they, they just looked at them and they said, well, this kind of work has basically been replaced by the camera. You know, so it's, it's kind of, wow. and this would have been around 1979, 1980. There, I, although I couldn't put into words, you know, why that sounded or what, what was wrong with a statement like that. But intuitively I knew you know, even then that there was, there was something not right about that and that whatever that, whatever she was selling, I wasn't buying it. So, you know, I just went to the next, the next booth or the next table and kept going around to these different schools. And finally, somebody from, from uh, PAFA, the Pennsylvania Academy was there and I showed them my work and they, they, they just said, Oh, this is great. The, you know, the Academy would be the perfect place for you because, that's a place where you could study traditional drawing and painting. And I just remember thinking, oh, okay, you know, sign me up. That's, that's great. Yeah, and that, that's basically how I ended up going to the academy. I didn't know anything about the academy. I had never heard about it. I didn't even know at the time that it was right there in Philadelphia until, you know, they, they explained that to me. Because <laughs> it could have been anywhere in Pennsylvania for all I know. So that's that's how I ended up going there, and the following fall, I I was enrolled there, and I was living in Philadelphia, and and that's how my art education began, or formal education, I should say. Started. What a stroke of luck, though, because you know I've interviewed a lot of um, artists, and and especially, you know, there's a period of time where representational art was just you know, I mean, I think in some ways it, it kind of still is, but there was there was a whole period in the school systems where it was just not. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and that's been a topic of a lot of conversation with with some realist artists. There's a really interesting uh, story written by I think his name is F. Scott Hess, or uh-huh. he's a he's yeah he's from the West Coast. He, I think he's from 
the uh, from Southern California, and he wrote an article in the Huffington Post oh, a couple of months ago about that very thing, about how how in art schools, uh, especially for those of us, you know, who who were in school during the 70s and the 80s, how art schools were, you know, they were very unfriendly, you know, to the idea of you know, people or students doing realist work. That was very, it, it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't fashionable at the time. And so there was a lot of pushback. And I've heard all sorts of stories from people uh, about their encounters with various instructors and professors in art schools and uh, things like that. Luckily for me, when I heard someone that day that, that I went to the portfolio day that I just described, luckily for me, I had enough I, I, I was secure enough, even at 17, to know that I wasn't going to let a remark like that sway me because that actually could have been very devastating to hear from somebody being so young. Yeah. And and I think that that's when I hear stories like that of people people that are older, like my generation, and I and like I said, I have heard a number of stories. It's it's really sad. There's been a big in the last 15 years or so, 15 maybe. 20 pushing it mm-hmm. since about the mid 90s there's been a there has been a, a big change at least as far as you know art academies and atelier style schools cropping up all over the US on the east coast and the west coast and and then a whole bunch in between and now there's been this like uh, this return to uh, the idea of you know learning how to draw and paint figuratively and getting that kind of solid grounding, which is which is good to see, yeah, because yeah. like as I said, you know, back in the '80s and up until maybe the mid '90s, late '90s, you know, in the in in the education world, you just didn't see things like that, and and even today, still on the on the college and university level, you're still not you still uh, in MFA programs and things like that, I'm still hearing about how. You know, drawing and painting is just not really, like, not in a traditional sense. It's just not really a priority. Which is, in my theory, is that that's why these atelier style schools have been cropping up over this past decade. Yeah, and they're so um, immensely just, popular. It is, yeah. But uh, as I said, you don't really seem to see that in like in big universities and MFA programs. It's still very much about you know other things, conceptual art, and uh, you know whatever. I, it, it varies, right, though. I right, mean, but right. but you and you teach. You teach. Um, you teach your own workshops, and do you teach at a at the university level, or how do you? No, I don't. Okay. No, um, no. Thankfully, I don't teach in academia. I don't think it, that really would be for me. Um, Why not? I have. Well. <sighs> Well, a, I, I don't want to be. I don't want to be constrained. Have to teach on a regular basis. B, I think for those very reasons I just mentioned mm-hmm. about the kind of climate which exists in, in academia, I don't think I would be comfortable teaching in an environment where you know, I, I really have to, I, I'd really have to concern myself about or compete with the idea of you know, people that are not, or, or a faculty or an institution that's not really interested in... Right, the politics involved in that would just make right. it. Yeah, you, actually, your actually, your job would be managing those politics. Yes, exactly. That's the word I was looking for, <laughs> pop politics. Um, I, have, I've, I have no interest whatsoever in all of the, po- the political stuff that goes on. And I, I've just heard so many stories from people that do teach in academia and in art schools that I, I just don't want to have anything to do with that. So I'm relatively new to teaching. I've only been teaching for about four years now. Oh. And... The work, uh, the, you know, the teaching that I do, which is in workshops, and I, I, I hold workshops around the country, you know, maybe five, six times a year I do. I travel to different states around the U.S. and, and hold workshops. That suits me a lot better. That, that's, that suits my personality as being more of a self-employed sort of, you know, an individual who gets to do, and make, I make my own schedule. I, I'm able to you know, do everything on my own and say, these are my terms. Mm-hmm. This is when I want to teach. This is where I want to teach. This is how I want to teach. And I don't really need to worry about anything political or, you know, whether I'm sort of fit in or don't fit in with a certain 
mindset at, at a certain institution. Right. How did you start doing that? So you've been, I mean, because you've been, you've been painting and showing your work for decades and what made you decide, okay, now I want to teach. Did you come to that conclusion or did somebody say, hey, David? Well, actually, it was a decision, by default, the decision was sort of made for me <laughs> in, in, uh, when was the stock at market the stock market crash in two thousand eight? Two thousand eight. Yeah, that's a big year for <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, that that had a lot to do with it. Prior to that, I had just been painting and exhibiting my work in galleries, and um, that changed quite a lot in when the stock market went went through the not the roof but the, the floor the opposite <laughs> <laughs> went through the floor it bottomed out, and I had to start thinking of you know, other ways that I was going to be an artist, not just be an artist, but, you know, other ways that I could make income. It it happened gradually over, you know, many months, actually. I think it started out as just, you know, teaching a class, you know, like a one-day class. Somebody, you know, somebody, a friend, I think, suggested that I could teach a a one-day workshop or a two-day workshop at some local school somewhere. And and I said, oh, okay, you know, that, that would be an idea. And I could make a couple of hundred dollars and teach for, you know, one day or two days or whatever it was. And that kind of got the wheels in my head turning. And and gradually over, you know, maybe six months to a year, I, I started to contact other artists who were teaching workshops and uh, found some institutions where I could, you know, that would in, that were willing to invite me to come out to wherever and, and hold a four or five day workshop. And it, it kind of went from there. You know, there was a little bit of a learning curve at first, but then, you know, but then after after a little while, I started to get the hang of you it. You find your groove. I'm you sorry? You find your groove. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Was it hard for you to um, sort of like switch from being, you know, just because painting is so solitary. So you're, you know, usually either out in the field or in your studio painting and then to have like right. a, kind of a... A group of people around you and have to explain everything that you're doing. How how was that transition? Well, well it, that that took a little a little getting used to because, as you said, it being a painter who's just in their studio all the time is very solitary. But the upside of all of that is that it was it's actually been a very good thing for me because I I do enjoy teaching and I've been told by a lot of students that I'm good at I'm, I'm good at it. And so it's been it's good been good for me because it does get me. It gets me out of the studio. It gets me interacting with people. It gets uh, I get to travel around and do that, and it still leaves me you know, plenty of time throughout the year to be doing my own work in the studio. One of the most kind of awkward things to have to do with a class or a workshop is doing demonstrations. Demonstrations are a big part of workshops, and all the students love watching work uh, demonstrations. Yeah, they they really love watching. In fact, I think that if I were to just do a demonstration, just nothing but demonstration, a lot of them would that would suit them just fine. As opposed to you know spending some time actually painting, you know having them do some painting. So they they really love to watch. But it is doing a demonstration in front of people for an artist. To, to me, I don't know how how it is with a lot of other painters but to me it's a little awkward and it it just doesn't there's a part of that that doesn't feel quite natural because artists by their nature practice their craft in solitude and you don't usually have people around you Mm -hmm. and and i i like my solitude and i like to be able to work on my own in my studio so that takes a little getting used to being able you know to paint in front of people and i'm kind of talking as I'm painting and I encourage people to ask questions, but I try to just go into this sort of a zone and do what I do. But the other interesting thing about that, and I tell students this is that the way I paint in, in a class for in do, doing a demonstration is different than the way I would probably paint in my studio because the demonstration by its nature is something where, you know, the whole idea is to communicate a process and so I have, I find myself, you know, because I'm, I'm trying to teach, I'm finding myself being more, I try to be more methodical and to explain the process or the steps that I'm, I'm going through 
as I'm painting. Whereas, you know, if you're just in your studio and you're painting and, and students have asked me this, they'll say, well, would you do that thing? Like that step or that process you just showed us or you just described, would you do it the same way if you were in your studio or would you do it differently? And usually my answer to that is I would do it. I'd probably do it a little differently because I might cut corners and skip different steps and things like that. So that's like one difference between, you know, showing someone how you paint. Yeah. And then just... Because you, is that because you don't want to take risks? Like you want to make sure uh, that the the demonstration is a su- successful? Well, there's that too. And then sometimes, sometimes students will say, you know, okay, we see that you're trying to do this and we understand the steps and the process and the reason why you would want to describe the process, you know, in a sequential order. But, oh, in the last workshop, I had some students that said that they, even though they understood what I was doing in the demonstration, as far as describing, you know, the different steps in a sequential order, they wanted to see something that was, you know, above and beyond that, that was like, they wanted to see, like, how do you handle things like, you know, the edges and how do you Mm. How do you, the things that are more characteristic of the work, you know, the paintings that you would, that you would see that I do uh, uh, in my studio. Yeah, because they're super, lo- I mean, they're, they're and, really free and loose and tight at the same time. They're really interesting. Right. And, and that's, and that is something that, that sometimes students want to see. Uh, sometimes it's a little, it's a little off-putting to me because it's, it's difficult to explain, you know, an advanced step. Mm-hmm to some people when, because there's a lot of, there are many steps that went before that. And it's, (laughs) so from their point of view, I can understand, you know, the desire to see that, Yeah. like show us the, you know, how do how do you arrive at that? So I understand it from their point of view, but at the same time, you know, somebody who teaches that it's difficult to, it's difficult to encapsulate, you know, 30, I've been painting for you know, like over 30 years now. It's been since I've been out of art school. It's it's really difficult to just kind of bypass all of that and just get to the, you know, the end result. And also, yeah, I mean, it seems like, I don't know, you tell me, tell me, but I'm wondering if part of the issue is that when you are painting on your own, you can go into like, your your zone that state that flow etc and it's 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 intuition is such a huge part of it so there's a particular part of your brain that's working but when you are sort of bringing language into it and bringing um analytics into it in order to explain what you're doing i don't it's i don't know how you could have both states at the same time yeah they are they they are in my mind two different things and and I've really had to, that's taken me a little while now to, you know, I've been doing the workshops now for you know, three or four years. And that's, that is part of what I've had to learn to do, because as I said, that's what students want to see. That's a big part of it, but it's kind of, a, but at the same time, it's this kind of strange thing to, to, to be asked to do, <laughs> but I do it as best I can. And I talk about it as best as I, as best I can mm-hmm. always ultimately at, when we when when students start asking me you know the more advanced questions about you know well how do you arrive at doing the kind of work that you do now given you know I had this very traditional classical training and my work early on was much tighter and much more academic for lack of a better word and evolved over many many years and students will ask well but how did you you know how is it that you you have come to paint the way you do now especially given my background, uh, you know, very traditional and classical training. And I, you know, basically I, I'll tell you what, what I tell them, which is it didn't happen overnight. It, it took many, many years. It was a slow, gradual evolution and took a lot of, a lot, a lot of risk taking and a lot of trashing paintings and ruining paintings. This is the part where, you know, I'm not afraid to say, <laughs> we talked about this earlier, but where I'm not afraid to just, you know, tell you, yeah, it's difficult and it's scary going through a process where you kind of abandon everything that you you thought that you knew or that you have known, and you kind of step outside your comfort zone and say, "I'm I'm going to try something experimental here, and and if I make a mess or fall flat in my face, well, 
you know, that's part of the process. And I'll just have to kind of get up and dust myself off and, and just keep trying. And that's basically how I started painting the way that I'm painting presently. So do you remember that transition or that kind of turning point when you went from the very academic tight work to what you're doing now? I mean, knowing that it's, it didn't, you didn't wake up one morning and just do it like that there was a, (laughs) yeah, I wasn't like flipping a light switch, but, um, well, I can tell you this, let's put it, uh, I came out of art school where I had been doing some very tight academic work. And then after art school, I think just being out of art school, then, then I became a plain air painter for many years. And that right, that right there was something that kind of loosened me up a little bit just by nature of just because of the requirements of being a plein air painter you're outside in you know this ever-changing environment where the sun's moving wind blowing clouds are moving and that kind of painting required me to work faster and to kind of make things up so even though i don't think i realized it at the time i think that was sort of I was actually in training Mm -hmm. way back then for, you know, where I would arrive today. But so I did that for a number of years. And then I'd say maybe after a dozen years out of maybe 10, 11, 12 years out of art school, the plain air thing was getting a little, that was starting to feel a little bit constraining. And I had a desire to try other things. And I didn't know what form they would take, but I resolved to, just try experimenting. And it was in the early 90s, and, and I got some really large four-by-four-foot boards and um, got some large brushes and just started doing some really experimental, kind of quasi-surreal, abstract work. And, um, and I did that for a couple of years. And that, if nothing else, really shook things up in my head. And introduced me to the idea that I could explore any number of of possibilities and that with a certain kind of training under your belt or a certain, if you have enough technique, you know, you you have the more tools in your toolbox, Mm -hmm. the more you can do. And that really shook things up for me and got the, you know, got the wheel spinning in my head. And I'd say that was my first experience in, in trying experimental ideas and was it hard for you to make that turn? I'm just wondering, like, were, so because you had been showing your work before, right? Well, at that point, at that point, I wasn't really yet showing my work on a regular basis. I was still kind of, I was only about like oh, 10 or 11 years out of art school at that point. Mm-hmm. So I hadn't really, really started showing the way I, that didn't, that actually didn't come until a little bit later. So at that point, it wasn't really a big issue as far as, well, how, you know, how would galleries react or, you know, to what you're doing? Mm-hmm. That wasn't yet an issue. Was it an issue with you in any way that, you know, okay, I've been doing this, you know, I've been focusing in this one direction and now I'm going to, you know, kind of abandon it. Did you ever feel like, oh, that was, that was in some ways easier. I want to go back to that. Or were you just totally excited by well, it was a very big issue. It was, a, it was a very scary thing. You know, it's like suddenly, said it's about getting outside of your comfort zone. It's about like all the think of all the things that you might be comfortable doing in your in your life, and then suddenly deciding I'm gonna I'm gonna put all of that aside. I wouldn't say throw it away, but put that aside and sort of like do this do this crazy thing here. I'm not quite sure why, but I want to know that there's something in me that that's telling me that I need to, I need to push myself in some other direction. And the only way that I'm going to discover that is to try something different. And that was sort of my guiding principle. Mm -hmm. Now, those kinds of paintings that I was doing for a couple of years, I, 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 I kind of came back a little bit back toward, you know, less, out there surreal painting but as I came back it was like maybe I shouldn't say back like in a straight line back but off just maybe in another you know in a diagonal direction or something but a but a little closer back to my roots in more traditional classical painting yeah but the what that experiment that I was describing helped me do was just explore a different way of painting I started using 
uh, I started introducing photographs or using photographs in my work and composing or coming up with compositions using photographs, exploring different subject matter. It just opened everything up for me so that I could see, you know, that I had I had all kinds of options. Were there any other artists that were that you were looking at that influenced your choices? Well, at the time, I think I just I think I just started looking at more work. Like I, I, I can remember looking at maybe being introduced to uh, Lucian Freud's work and looking a little, looking at you know, getting some books on um, Francis Bacon and people like that, and just open expanding my 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 vision to what was possible. Because up until about that time, when I was a student in the years at, directly after my student years. I had a pretty, I'd say a pretty narrow idea of what art had to be. I was, I was much, much more traditional Mm -hmm. and a lot more conservative in my thinking at the time and really wasn't even interested in looking at contemporary work, you know, until I was maybe until I was about 30 or in my early thirties. So yeah, it was like all around, it was just this, this big change for me. I'm going to start working differently. I'm going to start painting differently. I'm going to start thinking about subject matter differently. And I'm going to start looking at other painters that I, you know, up until that point really wasn't interested in looking at. Yeah, it was a, it was a pretty big revelation for me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Painter podcast. As always, show notes can be found at SavvyPainter.com. Also on the website, you can sign up for the email list, which gets you free guides and special offers. I'm working on something really cool that I hope will be finished in the next couple months. And that is for people who subscribe to the list. So go to SavvyPainter.com. You'll see a link in the sidebar to join the rest of the group. Next week, we'll have part two of the David Chiblino interview. Until then, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.